Hello, everybody, and thanks for joining us again on C-Mask, the Christian Masculinity Podcast. This is episode 13, and we've got a treat for you today. We'll be recapping the main concepts from all 12 episodes so far. We've got Dr. Robillard, ex-Army Ranger. We've got Timothy Gordon, author of The Case for Patriarchy, host of Rules for Retrogrades. And we've also got Elliot Hulse, strongman and mentor to millions. So, guys, I thought we'd kick off with a few kind of headline concepts about the church's position on marriage and the family, thinking about how it fits into society more broadly. And then we'll get into our 12 topics. And the idea is that you'll each give a key point and you can bounce off each other's ideas too. So run down then to get things going. The family is the necessary society constituted immediately by every fruitful marriage. You guys can jump in on these big headline concepts whenever you want. The efficient cause of the family is the promise of mutual fidelity in the work of procreation and education of offspring. I think that's a big one. Parents' duty isn't just to procreate, but also to educate as well. Too many people have forgotten that. Education is the raising of children to the level of complete adulthood and comprises bodily training, intellectual instruction, and formation in prudence and the virtues directed by prudence. We've talked a lot about how some of those areas have become weak in recent decades, and a big part of a father's role in particular is going to be strengthening them in the years ahead. Marriage can be contracted only by a man and woman capable of carnal intercourse. In other words, it's not something we can change by vote. You can't decide that gay marriage is real marriage. This isn't the kind of thing that's up to us any more than we could vote for a triangle to have four sides. Metaphysically, it makes no sense. So marriage isn't purely a, a social construct. Now, what about authority within the marriage? Well, authority is that elevation of one above another within a society which consists in or gives the right to command in view of obtaining the end of that society. Tim, in particular, has written really well on this. Controversially, although it shouldn't be controversial, this next point is where authority comes into the family. The husband has the natural right to govern his wife so that their family may attend its end. I can hear those pearls being clutched, as Tim likes to put it. I can hear the shrieks of dismay. But crucially, he ought to desire her counsel and aid in his government. So the husband and wife are working together as a team for the common good of the family. But the husband is ultimately the captain or head. The parents have the natural right to govern their children in view of the goal of their common domestic society. It's funny how many guys are worried about getting married thinking they'll have no authority over their wives, but you don't often hear people talking about we can't have kids because we won't have authority over them. But within the family, both go together. So husband, natural authority over the wife, parents, natural authority over the children for the good of everyone involved. Now, we also got the family is prior to the temporal commonwealth in notion and in reality, and hence has duties and rights which are independent of it. So the family is the foundation of civil society, or as the catechism puts it, the original social cell. And I think this is probably one of the most important points. The family and not the individual is the basic unit of the temporal commonwealth. This is where so much modern thinking goes wrong in taking the atomized individual as the building block. Whereas really that's not what human beings are. We're fundamentally social and the family is the first society. Last but not least, feminism is a symptom of not only female, but also male failure. This is a point that is often overlooked today with too many men trying to blame women exclusively. Okay, I think those are all the fundamental aspects of the church's teaching and the perennial philosophy on the family and the society that we've touched on so far. 
let's get back into a rundown of some of our particular topics. So show one was promiscuous men are actually feminists. Let's kick off. Tim, why? F feminism is the sex revolution. Promiscuity is the formal act of the sex revolution. If, if uh, such thing could be equated to a thing that has a formal act. It takes two to tango. <laughs> and it, that, I mean, when we did that show, folks treated it like we were trying to say it for shock value or we thought we'd come up with really something creative. And we were just saying, A is A. If you engage in the sex revolution, fornication, you're using contraception, you're open to abortion, you're, you're acknowledging that men and women are, that there's an egalitarian equation between men and women. Uh, you're saying power is not to fathers, power is to each atomized individual to enter into some sort of overnight contract, to have a tryst. There's nothing about it that's anti-feminist. There's nothing about it that's anti-feminist. Every man that fornicates with a woman is signing away his own rights to protect a baby that should result from the union. So I don't, I don't see what of that kind of lifestyle is anti-feminist the way too many have been brainwashed to assume. Elliot, what's wrong with these dummies? They can't understand that fornication is feminism. The way Tim's put it, what's the controversy? Well, because whenever you take away a baby's baba or something sweet to a little kid, he's going to whine and cry and rant. Um, and that's basically what it is when you speak to men in terms of what is right and what is righteous and what is good. Uh, you're taking away that which satisfies their lower nature, right? The desire for pleasure. That's a tough pill to swallow when we're constantly being pumped in our brains through music, movies, media, that uh, to be a man is to seek pleasure, right? In all regards, right? Pleasure, wealth, power, uh, and women rank right up there with what the culture pumps into our brains. And so it's like we are initiated as men into, into a, a form of, uh, I don't know, quasi manhood or half boyhood where we receive our, our, ver our value or they even promote these vices as virtue. And so it's, it's really the things that we're talking about, although they may seem like they make sense to us, uh, we're older, married men with families, daughters, uh, to most men, this is totally counterculture. And so it sounds crazy. I know the first time I heard a lot of these ideas, I cringed at first because like, well, this can't be true. I'm a free man. I can do whatever I want. But then when you really, really start noticing uh, the degradation of our society and then discover the enemy at hand and how this has been a deliberate takedown, you realize that sex and pleasure and the pleasure trap is the warfare. It is the warfare. If men can't deny themselves, then we become slaves to all these things that so-called liberate us. And sex is right at the top of that list. It's the easiest way to manipulate us is by sex. And so the promise of sex or the desire for sex is, you know, people say it's, it's in the Bible, right, that, that uh, money is at the root of all evil, but it almost seems as if in this day and age, sex might be the one, because most men are chasing money for sex. It really all boils down to living by their lower head. Yeah, really well put. I like the idea that it's uh, quasi-manhood. Mike, the only reason people fall for this stuff is because there's a grain of truth to it, right? Yeah, the... Um... There are uh, definitely drives that men have uh, towards these things. So it's, uh, yeah, that's, that's where there's a, a photo gets established. Just picking up on what Elliot had said, though, uh, reminding that the, the GK Chesterton, Chesterton quote, uh, that free love is the direct enemy of freedom. It is the most obvious of all the bribes that can be offered by slavery. So you have a lot of these folks in the red pill community thinking that what they're doing is manly, but what they're actually doing is withering the family structure. And that's necessarily cucking themselves 
as the state apparatus is going to come in and fill that role of patriarchy and of father. So there's nothing anti-establishment about being a man and being promiscuous because ultimately you run that individually and collectively over enough iterations that's just going to break down the family structure. The state's going to fill in the power gap. And now you're the, the, the pink police state now owns you. So there's nothing anti-establishment about it. It's pro-establishment. It's what the enemy wants. It's what the feminists set out to do. So, you know, that's, yeah. that's, that's a tough pill to swallow. That's the hard truth. Sexual liberalism was the spearhead of all liberalism and the guys doing what the propaganda tells them to do, uh, furthering the aims of their enemies. That's a great summary, guys. And you, and you, by acting like a pig, help to establish the caricature of men, which is a huge part, huge part of the leftist agenda. Because then they can rile up women against you even more. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's it. One of the devil's main aims is setting men and women against each other, because if you can break that, the two fundamental blocks that build society, then you're on your way to chaos. Right, so episode two was defending marriage in a degenerate age. Why does marriage matter then? We kind of hinted at it already. Tim. Asking why marriage matters is tantamount to asking why does civil society matter? Uh, Catholic Church rightly establishes that uh, marriage is the original civil society. The home is actually the original church. That's one we haven't talked about as much. It's called the Ecclesiola, the household in miniature by John Paul II, who was allegedly a Christian feminist, but he's still saying that the man is the priest of the uh, miniature church or the household church. So, of course, it's our first educational, it's our first education family. It's our household church. It's the single cell, the original cell of society. It's where children are given their ideas and they're given their real identity in Christ. Stop me when any of this sounds irrelevant. That the family matters. Socialization does not. You know, the word socialization is that buzzword that socialists started using here on our side of the pond. Well, early in the 20th century when you had... Uh, dimwits, communists like John Dewey taking over, telling parents they needed curricula to educate their own children. What? I know how to. I know how to think. I know how to educate my kids. I don't, we we do we homeschool. We don't use curricula. That's asinine. So not only should we keep the kids at home and not send them off, farm them out. Uh, beginning when they're like five, my my five year old came up here. My one boy, he followed me up here to the studio this morning. I can't imagine sending him out to kindergarten, which the socialists also added um, in the last hundred years to the to the curriculum to get him away from the mother earlier, which very agenda proves how important the family is. So you keep them home, you educate them, and there in the home, they can become a complete person in Christ. That's that's what it's all about. That's what this vocation is all about. If you choose not to become a priest. That's a great point. You know how important the family is because of how desperately they tried to attack it. Communal education for kids away from parents is one of the first moves that any kind of totalitarian system goes for. Elliot, why is marriage important to male authority then? So the narrative today is that marriage is tough, marriage is hard, marriage takes something away from you. You've got to sacrifice, especially as a man, you're losing something, you're giving something up, but very little is talked about the benefit to men and how practical it is. Um, I can't say that it's been out of my, the virtue of my heart that I am where I am in terms of being married early and having a long, happy, healthy marriage. But I can tell you that had I not been married early, I would have spilled my energy out wasting my time, my life, and my vitality, doing a lot of unfruitful things, having a bunch of unfruitful sex partners, and essentially never having the focus that was required in order to live a dignified life. Men thrive better in marriage. 
uh, we, it's, the statistics show this, right? Uh, I know that you've been really good, Will, at pointing out a lot of the, the false uh, narratives around marriage and family, but um, I'm sure you're aware of the statistics about how men thrive better in marriage in terms of their health. Uh, they're, they're wealthier. Um, they have better mental stability, all kinds of things in every single category. A man is better off, not just uh, you know in these ways personally, but like you say, the authority that, you know, that was your question, the authority that is invested in men give us a sense of dignity that allows us to rise to the capacity that God has given us uh, in terms of uh, how we can be our best selves. A man doesn't do well when he's put down. A man doesn't do well when he's subverted. A man doesn't do well when he's, when he's disrespected. Uh, so in every regard, the natural structure of the family, the natural traditional way of living and raising a family uh, raises men up. It's our, it's, it's, our, it's our best state, I would say. You don't become a real man. You're not formed into a real man until you take that place uh, as husband and father. And that's why it's so under attack. Feminism is, all, is primarily anti-father. That's really what it boils down to. You know, the, the whole take down the patriarchy idea is an attack on fatherhood, which is an attack on the family. And so that's, of course, the reason why men today are looking away from family, looking away from marriage and seeing it as something uh, negative rather than all the positive aspects of what marriage is. That's a great answer. And you can go back to feminists like Kate Millett saying that we have to promote promiscuity to destroy patriarchy by undermining men. So if you're doubting what Elliot's saying there, the feminists themselves say that was their agenda. Mike, I'm going to hit you with the personal question here. Tell me if you don't want to answer, but you're the only unmarried guy here. And what Elliot was saying there, the description of how life would have been for him if he wasn't married. You're looking to get married now, but you've been in the army for a lot of your life and you haven't settled down yet. Give me some thoughts about regrets and also why you want to get married now. Yeah, it's a yeah, huge regret of mine to have fallen into the, the red pill pickup space and, and fall down that, that path of depravity that, that wasted a lot of my time. I, you know, I sinned and wasted a lot of other women's time. And uh, Elliot is spot on saying that, yeah, waste a lot of my vitality and focus and uh i think a lot it's like um you look at like odysseus uh being tethered to the to the mast to get you know with his crew with his team to get to the destination that he really wants to get to and those are the, the contracts that bind us help us to get there and the the red pill life or the modern liberal male life is one where there aren't any thick commitments that tether us. So you just have dudes chasing the sirens, you know, chasing these, these phantoms uh, and dashing their lives in the rocks and hurting a lot of other people in the process. Uh, so I think that there is this weird narrative amongst men in our culture that I bought into it for a long time that it's like, yeah, like anything that restricts your freedom is somehow bad, right? But it's actually freedom enhancing and virtuous enhancing, um, you know, looking at it uh, from a more adult lens. And yeah, it's something that all you guys inspire me to. And you, you, you guys do exemplify and set the model of what a virtuous, like non-cucked um, Catholic <laughs> husband can look like. So I think that's also hopeful for folks like me or, or folks watching right now. Thanks for the honest answer, Mike. I think you're doing a lot of good using the lessons you learned the tough way to help other people see the right path. I'm thinking that you know how the, the Plains Indians would somehow uh, sometimes deliberately stampede buffalo as a way to hunt them. Well, you've got the sexual revolution as basically a way of stampeding men. Jeff Dench, the British scholar whose work got ignored by academia, described it as the male stampede from responsibility. And that stampede has led to men basically being driven off a cliff, which was the whole plan of attack in the first place. So combined, I think those three answers do a great job of illuminating that. Let's move on. 
Cobra Tate, a religious conservative, was episode three. Now, Tate isn't all bad, but there's plenty he gets wrong. And my big project at the moment is say a prayer for Tate. If he does go to jail, I'm worried he might get raped. And that's a terrible thing to happen to any guy. So let's all just spare him a thought. But why is he such a big deal? Why is there the Tate phenomenon? Tim. Because when you provide easy solutions to ubiquitous puzzles that everyone left, right, center sees out there, all the men anyway, left, right, center, see that their lives have been plagued. Uh, even if you're not married, you know, and your wife, your wife plagues you if you're a, a cucked kind of husband, you go to the store, you go to the bank, you go to the, the you know, farmer's market, you go to Disneyland, you go anywhere and you hear why. I mean, not at all times, but you, you do these things enough through the activity, the, the business of living, you hear wives screeching at their husbands. You turn on the TV, even if it's just a commercial, it's supposed to be passive. It's a Tide commercial. There's a political agenda. It's wives screeching at their husbands. The husband's the idiot. The wife is really smart looking at the screen like Jim Halpert in the first seasons of The Office. Anywhere. And the shows are all about it. All of the new cartoon characters for kids, the protagonists are female. female females aren't protagonists. Females are supporting characters, right? What's going on? So everyone sees the problem, and when you provide easy answers to ubiquitous problems that, that even the dummies can see, then, or when you cast your answers as easy answers, then you're going to be really popular. And I mean, it's, I'm, no, I'm not saying just anyone can do it. Uh, Cobra Tate is a man who fits the part, right? I mean, he seems cool he knows how to defend himself he's got billions you know like no, don't ask him how he made his millions but yeah sorry i didn't hear that oh no don't worry it's just a, a joke i like the bugatti batty that's uh my yeah. code name for kate for tate yeah he's he's he he gets chicks he gets chicks bro and it's like yeah so i mean uh, that is the precise trap pitfall attractive nuisance that that your typical dumb guy falls for i mean sorry sorry man but that's how it is when there's an obvious solution this is a very dangerous time if it is an obvious solution to a great big real unimagined problem because this is when the real demagogues step forward and say, here's your solution. And they might be 70% right, which I think the four of us agree. Uh, Tate's 70% right. He, he attacks feminism and sounds kind of wise, but he's only providing half the solution. So it's a very dangerous time when universal problems arise. Remember what, uh, uh, what's his face? Emmanuel said, uh, you know, Obama's advisor, he said, you never let a crisis go to waste. When there's a crisis, the demagogues arise with fake solutions. And that's, that's what, that's ultimately what all Tate's offered the world since he gained such fame is a, a fake solution to the problem of feminism. He sounds like com he combats it, but all of his solutions involve indulging it. So there's something there that he's grappled with that people are getting insufficient answer to elsewhere. And it seems like Tate has really nailed it. That reminds me of what one of the church fathers said about heresies, which is that they always grow best in the shade of truth. So, Elliot, what is it that you think Tate is onto? What heresy is growing in the shade of truth there? Well, what I think he's onto is riding the wave of the zeitgeist i can't help but to liken him onto donald trump i see so many par uh, parallels there you know donald trump's so-called uh his his rise to prominence that happened in a so-called uh, unexpected way uh really parallels what's going on with tate meaning that as everything tim just said uh there 
they're both guys that give a very simple answer to a complex question. Donald Trump with his sound bites and his his entertaining uh, way of being, uh, and also, which is in line with what we just what Tim just said, uh, it's there's a, there's a hunger, there's a crying out in the hearts of men, and a guy like a Donald Trump come to the rescue in a way, right? Uh, but both Tate and Trump, interesting, they both got T's. Uh, both Tate and Trump, I, I, I kind of struggle with also. So first of all, yeah, Tim, you're right. They only go about 70% of the way. But that 30% is very disconcerting because I can't help but think that even though Donald Trump trumps, trumpets the idea of being, you know, draining the swamp, he never did it. You know, yeah. it's like he was speaking, he was telling us everything we wanted to hear, but never really gave us the, the fullness of what he promised. And the same way with Tate, like, he's telling you what you want to hear, right? I listened to him, to, I listened to a little video about, you know, how to handle marriage. And it was completely ridiculous, but it was so entertaining. It was so fun. It was so self-righteous that you're going to draw attention, but then really, you never really give us the real solution. There's no real solution there. There was no draining of the swamp, just like there's no real repair of masculinity through a through a through a Tate. And also with the two of them, I can't help but think that there may be some element of controlled opposition at play here. I've heard on multiple occasions uh, Tate say that his father was a CIA agent. Uh, I can't help but think that somehow, in some way, perhaps he's a plant, and I, you know, and I don't, I don't discount that with Trump either. I think that perhaps he was a plant in order to draw out uh, a certain demographic that's dis, dis, uh, you know, not not doing so well, um, and then also to 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 continue to drum up strife between. The left and the right, man and woman, right and wrong, evil and good, just like to to pit us against each other a little bit more. So I can't help but think lately that the whole rise of trait, uh, Tate and the and of Trump, I should call him Trait. <laughs> Tate, Trait. <laughs> the rise of the of the two of them is somehow a psyop. I think I think they're plants and that we're being tricked. Well, Trump was arguably one of the most pro-LGBTQ presidents ever. And right. Tate, too, has described himself as a feminist before. And his philosophy just boils down to feminism ultimately, like get laid and get paid. What else has he got apart from that? So in terms of opposition to liberalism, there's not a lot there. But the the... The packaging of machismo makes it seem so attractive to frustrated young guys who feel emasculated. Mike, any thoughts to add on Tate? Yeah, I think uh, you know both both those answers were excellent, and uh, yeah, he he is he is hitting some notes that are correct with respect to pointing out the the excessive negative side effects of feminism and what's that that is done to men. So he's offering sort of a, sort of a red meat answer to uh, an otherwise cucked male um, demographic. Uh, but then in addition to that, if his conversion to Islam is sincere, then now he's offering maybe an, a, a new view that's getting a bit closer to the truth, right? It's getting closer to an account of theism and valuing of the family and valuing of natural law. But then that still, it misses the mark because for all the reasons we talked about it being a Catholic heresy, uh, you know, Islam's account of God is flawed. It's too impersonal. Islam's account of will and intellect are incorrect. And obviously their account of Christ is incorrect uh, and their account of heaven is incorrect. So, you know, at least his movement from red pill secularist to Islam is it's a, it's a step in the right direction. But I'm with Elliot on this. That seems to me like it almost might be a controlled opposition, right? It's like, okay, this guy's leading the men of the West, what to fornicate like crazy, then leave, then leave the West for Islam. I mean, that's, this is our leader we're looking towards, you know, that's, <laughs> that's the answer, right? Like that, right. that, that seems off, right? So, so, you know, maybe it is like a Pied Piper. Let's direct the men of, um, you know, of the West into the sort of like release valve uh, towards, towards Islam. 
as opposed to saying, no, let's rebolster uh, Christendom, right? That That's the true threat. Um, so I think that there is some uh, uh, point. To, I, I see what Elliot's saying. I, I agree with that. Very wise. So where do we look then to a genuine model of masculinity? Episode four, we talked about why Jesus is the epitome of masculinity. Tim, what struck you from that episode? What's the main point? Even in the Shia LaBeouf conversion podcast that he did with Bishop Robert Barron, he identified the, the problem that he had before he became a Christian with Christianity that typifies the problem that most young men have and are not in any meaningful way Christians. And it's also why society is feminist. Jesus is, by definition, the perfect man, the exemplar man. Now, his father, Joseph, is in some ways the perfect husband. Jesus never became a husband aside from being the bridegroom to the church in a Christological, ecclesiological sense, but that's another matter. Jesus is the ideal man, virtue by virtue, pound for pound. And if, like Shia LaBeouf says he did, and like I did as a young man, and like most young men do, he mistook Jesus as being effeminate for not fighting back against the Roman Empire, or against the Jews and the Sanhedrin, then you're going to miss the whole point, and society is going to be stricken by the precise kind of malady that it is now, feminism. Um, instead, and I think Shai also said, like, he thought John the Baptist was masculine before, but not Jesus. That's exactly what I thought. That's exactly what I thought as a young man. Like Michael Knowles says, by the time I was confirmed, I was an atheist. I got confirmed in the eighth grade. I, I'd been an atheist long before. I got confirmed, as a matter of fact. I don't know if I ever believed it when I was a kid. So it's because you have female teachers at the Catholic schools, or if you go to public school, the, the uh, CCD teachers. You have mostly female catechists. You have females running the chanceries. You have females running uh, the administrations of the parish schools. You have females running the parishes. And they have given the world precisely what you'd expect. What happened in the original sin? When, when Eve was given, Eve commandeered Adam's job, dialoguing with, with outsiders like the serpent. He would have crushed its head. Eve instead capitulated to it. And so all the world has to uh, suffer sickness, sin, and death. That's a, that's a real problem. I mean, when you see Jesus as anything but the perfect man, you are not going to have a model because you've eschewed the perfect model. And, you know, 2,000 years later, we are in the worst crisis in the history of the world, worse than arguably Adam and Eve, even though that was the original fall. We're reliving the sin of Adam and Eve, which is feminism, because we've rejected the Redeemer as the ideal man. Elliot inversion of the proper roles of men and women and we need to understand why jesus offers men the way forward so i really am hanging up on what tim said in terms of who is teaching about jesus and you're right it's mostly women and that right there is the inversion right like why aren't more men teachers um and to that point why are boys and girls taught together in the same way Right. What this idea that we should be um, integrated as boys and girls, then I, I don't know how else to say it, but it blurs the line between men and women. Right. Because we're all treated the same by another woman. And so women become our Lord. Women become our teachers. Women become our guides. And so women then give their version of Jesus to most to most men and the world has adopted feminism the church has adopted feminism hook line and sinker i once heard that one of the worst things that can happen to a man is that he sees his father's through see his father through his mother's eyes for whatever it's worth he's got to be able to see his father through his own eyes uh the, the 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 way the mother portrays the father is always going to be blurred by or uh 
you know, seen through the lens of the feminine. And so this whole, you know, particularly in terms of Christianity, right? Like we're looking at the world, but so they say that, right? Like as the church goes, so goes the world. And I, you know, and I've heard that somewhere. Um, but the feminization of the of the of the church of the of the Catholic schools uh, and the quote unquote rise of Eve in our midst. Uh, I'm just you know following through with everything that Tim just said there, and I think that has a lot to do with it. Mike, I think Elliot and Tim are right on the money here. They're overlapping over the same kind of concepts. Yeah, yeah, I, I I totally agree, and that they've just pretty much summarized what what my Catholic upbringing was. It was a very watered down, hyper feminized ver version of Catholic teaching, and, and recognized at the time. But yeah, it it was like a, uh, yeah, it was it was omnipresent. You know, the, the fish can't see the water kind of thing, and uh, I think what men need, I mean, particularly what Elliot said, they need teaching by men in ways that men understand in their own space and that you know hopefully we can start returning back to that and getting back to to the theme of what you know what, what christ's sacrifice was it was the perfect sacrifice and, and men want there's a yearning for sex self-sacrificial um behavior towards something greater than themselves and i think that you know that that is what needs to be tapped back into in terms of pedagogy towards towards young men and, and you know men of all ages yeah exactly without self-sacrifice no masculinity is the overcoming of boyhood narcissism it was uh, fulton sheen who said that uh, each person has to discover in christ like, his own thing that he resonates with and for men to rediscover that spirit of self-sacrifice, I think is crucial. And what I see is a guy who chose to be born, unlike anybody else, refused pain relief on the cross, knelt to nobody except God, and bled to save everyone. And this in many ways sums up the ideal that people are quite happy to talk about being masculine when it's, well, you were a ranger, when it's to do with the military. But for some reason, they're blind to it when it comes to the absolute pinnacle of it. Yeah, certainly. Certainly. He also, he also, this is really important, as a leader figure, this is super manly. He was so divisive. He was such a dark knight. Sorry for the impoverished modernistic term. But he was such a dark knight that he knew that he would turn households against each other you know, mother against daughter, father-in-law against son-in-law. Brothers would argue over the meaning of the cross. He came to bring not peace, but a sword. That's fucking based. <laughs> like, there's no other way to say it. He's, Jesus is manly. He was dope. That's yeah, just, that, it, it's straightforward. That's the, that's the facts over feelings slogan that people often like to throw around now, but even setting family members against each other for the sake of the truth. That's a good point, Tim. Then we went to, in episode five, Agenda 2030 and the plan to depopulate the planet. And we were talking a little bit about female sports here as well, which we came back to in a later episode. But how is this attack on manhood and the family connected to the depopulation agenda? Mike, let's start with you this time. So this goes back, this is an Tim, Tim and I's book as well with uh, Don't Go to College, first iteration of this. You have folks like Bert, Burton Russell, uh, Algis Huxley, of, you know, started UNESCO and wrote uh, New Bottles for New Wine. Um, there's that, um, the, the early Rockefeller documents about this, right, where they openly say, we want to socially engineer the world into a one world cosmopolitan government. This is our plan. This is the utopian vision of a secular world that we want we don't you know we we have perfect peace and there'll be no war because there won't be any nations and there won't be any religions or uh, families or th people won't have any thick commitments to care about or to fight one another about and uh you know we'll just be drones i suppose right we'll just be this this permanent slave class of consumer uh pacifist consumers and uh they openly say this, right? It's not a conspiracy. You, you just read all of it. And that was what they were going for. And then you see the 2.0 version of this emerge 
with things like the um, United Nations, with the World Economic Forum, with um, Gates Foundation, various things at Oxford. And it's the 2.0 version of this, oftentimes under the guise of climate emergency or um, uh, some type of extinction event. And they're like, well, people just can't breed anymore. We got to get rid of families because, you know, whatever. And this just becomes the the policy prescription for the the global citizen right that's what they want they don't want partiality to faith family flag they want nobody not having any any thick commitments to anything that's their plan Mm -hmm. and they say it you can find it tim anything there you want to add to well i would just say that we're living through the culmination of we're living through a a culmination of confluence of feminism. It's second or third iteration, which is LGBTQ and one world government. And so in documents like agenda 2030, which is the re-energized version of agenda 21, which they formed, I think in 1992, 21 was for the 21st century. Agenda 2030 is the updated version. Uh, The beer bug over the last three years has been the major Kickstarter supply. It's been a catalyst supplying the activation energy. Has shown us that they're really organized, the globalists, and they really, really, really well understand with a superhuman demonic intelligence, which is ultimately the agency behind this thing, that... They have to get men to stand down. They they have to get men not to be Christians. They have to make women want to supplant men more aggressively than they did with, quote unquote, first, second or third wave feminism. And that's why you have surprising addenda. They're small, but they're they loom large in the document of Agenda 2030 itself. We talked about. Men must be supplanted by females, not just in the movies. It's not just in protagonist roles, lead roles. It's also in the average way that the young man relates to his manhood via sports. So we we talked in that episode about how in Agenda 2030, they want to get, it is a goal of global world government to get females into sports. And I I shared in that episode, I taught at the same school, Catholic school, two different times. I taught there in 2007, then I returned in uh, 2014. So I was gone for seven years. In between those two times, most of the, in 07, most girls still wanted to be cheerleaders, which is very natural. It's very healthy, well-ordered, appropriate. And by 2014, this Agenda 2030 had begun to take root and none of the girls were cheerleaders anymore. The, the cool cool chicks, the popular girls were not cheerleaders anymore. They all The popular girls all played sports and it was now with this weird androgynous unisex thing where the girls would kind of go to the guys' sports on almost by contract, the guys would go view the girls' sports and they were trying to make them like co-main events which you also see in the blood sports and, and stuff that they'll, they'll try to, they've tried to make co-main event, uh, a male fight and a female fight. It's really, really, really disordered. And I just wanted people in that episode to think, to understand we weren't being overly fringe. This is, this is a, a part of agenda 2030 for a reason. For sure. And what we said about Tate, I think, applies to an extent to Jordan Peterson as well, who admits having worked for the UN on both agendas. And he, like Tate, fails to provide truly substantial opposition to some of the fundamental premises. And you can see, for example, in his recent affirmation of gay marriage, that unless you tackle those principles, the premises right at the root, you end up being swept away by the logic of them. Elliot, you've made it clear that the people trying to get men to ejaculate into little rubber bags, condoms, are not their friend. They are part of the attack on masculinity. Small families and depopulation go together, don't they? Depopulation 
go together. Uh, yeah, I would agree with there. You're much easier to control, right? When you control the population, you literally control the, the size of the population by limiting procreation. And just so it's just so interesting to see how it is a literal inversion. It's like the new world order is the ape of Christendom where in with regard to Christendom and following the Bible, we're told to procreate, be fruitful, multiply. It's almost like, it's interesting because I've heard that many of the Freemason rituals and many of their ideas are literally taken from the Catholic church, but then just turned around. And it almost seems like this, <laughs> this liberal world order, this new world order, you know, the agenda 30 that we're talking about, all these things are, the, they're literally the opposite of Christendom. It's the fake kinship of, of Christ. And so I, I guess that's the way Satan works, right? It's like he takes what is right, what is good, what is true, what is beautiful, and literally turns it on its head. I mean, we see it so obviously with transgenderism and everything that Tim is talking about with the, the swapping of roles of boys and girls in school. Um, why would it be any different with family, right? God tells us, be fruitful, multiply. So Anti-God is going to tell us, don't be fruitful, don't multiply. Yeah, really well put. And uh, it's not a coincidence that Marx said everything that exists deserves to burn. There's a hatred of the goodness, beauty, truth of creation at the heart of all of this. And it gets directed most fundamentally at the child and most demonically in the womb, which is why abortion is one of the fundamental pillars that is holding this whole thing up. And that brings us to our next topic, which was liberalism, mm. the God that failed. What Elliot was saying there about these things having to ape Christianity, being like a, a perverted copy of them, is that human beings, being what we are, creatures made for worship, never escape it. And liberalism, without people knowing it, is actually a kind of theocracy. You think that you are free of religion worship but no really it's just idolatry let's say a bit more about why it's the god that failed mike yeah it's um it's an idolatry that is based upon as we said before in other episodes of false anthropology of man so telos is removed and now you have the champion not championing not of sexual complementarity not of the family as the singular singular social cell individual is now the the new idol that we all look towards and uh the liberal democracy takes on a almost quasi spiritual uh component rights claims human rights takes on a new uh, uh spiritual sacramental um, quality to it. And, uh, people just need to wheel out those rhetorical terms in order to, um, get people to bow down to them, to win arguments. And it, it, then it has its secular high priests in the forms of, you know, whatever, uh, Steven Pinker or Sam Harris or Neil deGrasse Tyson, etc. The science is going to tell us, uh, how to live. And uh, yeah, it functions just like a religion and uh, it, it's just a secular one. So it's not uh, above and beyond uh, being a religion in, in, in its own right. Tim, you, you've written a lot on this and uh, the true roots of America in Catholic Republic. What do you see as being important about liberalism as the, the God that failed? Well, I, I see it being really important to not conflate liberty with liberalism the way a lot of the, you know, the author of that claim that liberalism is a God that failed does. So if you take liberalism as, you know, modern secular humanism, then great. It's, it's, uh, it's what led us here. If you take liberalism as a lot of these thinkers like Patrick Deneen and Adrian Vermeule do to mean any, uh, government built upon the family liberty limited government then then they're totally totally wrong and it's totally against the masculinism project but 
as a, as a matter. I, I mean, so the, really what animates any good form of government, the church has three, three regimes that's traditionally affirmed. It doesn't have to be a monarchy. It can be an aristocracy or a republic besides. Um, and it, it's pick the government that suits your people the best. There are three corrupt forms of each of those. That's tyranny, oligarchy, and democracy. Those are the wicked forms of those three good governments, according to Thomas Aquinas. Pick which one suits you best. But what they three have in common is the, a concept that would get a term in 1931 by Pope Pius XI called subsidiarity. All three of them function on localism, where the most local government that has the, the capacity to rule does. What's the most local government? People will say, well, I guess that's municipal government. Then you get county, state, country, whatever. No, most local government is ruled by fathers, patriarchy. That means household rule. If you have good fathers, you don't need much government. That's Catholic teaching. You only kick it out to municipal government when there's something outside the competency of fatherly rule. So basically most of that morality should fall to fathers. Then, then it goes next to city government, then county, then state, then only, only as a, a, a federal moral, moral legislation uh, should be the last option. All these smaller cities of government get the right of first refusal. That's how this is related to patriarchy. Uh, subsidiarity is patriarchy. And that's, that unites, you know, at least two of my, my, my books, if not three, two of my projects, if not three. Uh, subsidiarity means rule by fathers in most cases. And it does mean you're going to have limited government. Sorry, sorry, LARPers. The, the far away uh, central government, Washington, D.C. is 5,000 miles away from Honolulu. Like, what have they over here got to legislate about they over here? Nothing. That only the very most uh, structural, procedural laws should should govern Honolulu, Hawaii from, from Washington, D.C. And if everyone's got a good father in the home, it works. And if everyone doesn't have a good father in the home, then you should only kick that legislative function to the very next most local sphere, which is city government. That's very, very important. And like we said about Andrew Tate, who's providing easy solutions to a, an obvious problem, even the idiots see the problem. We have this, this issue now where people are using something that Mike taught me called a, a Mott and Bailey fallacy to equate liberalism, which is bad, with libertyism. Liberty is good. So I, I don't, like we said with Tate, I don't trust a lot of the people on the new right who are bringing this solution of right-wing big government from, from Washington, D.C., from far away. That's not the solution. Once again, localism, meaning patriarchy, always is. That's it. Liberalism has only lasted for as long as it has done and had the grip on people that it has done because there's an element of truth to it. It too is a Christian heresy and you've articulated what's true in it really well. Elliot, you get a lot of guys coming to you for help and direction in their lives. I'm guessing some of them have found out that this idol of liberalism, living for themselves alone, has like all idols broken their hearts and it's not worthy of their worship. Yeah. You know, picking up where Tim left off, it's because they are in fatherless homes. And so they're needing to look outside the, uh, the val what would be a righteous value structure within the home led by a father that is worthy of following and emulating and mirroring and being mirrored by him uh, to any Pied Piper that will give them uh, a, 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 a pleasurable direction to walk in that's more ego feeding than soul saving. And so, you know, we're talking in terms of the failure of uh, of liberalism, the guy that failed. Well, in many ways, it succeeded, obviously. It's it's achieved its goal of destroying the family in order for big government to exist. As T Tim pointed out, the small government needs to be destroyed. And so the government of the home, the family structure has been the main attack. Um, but anybody who is looking clearly can see that well, no one's happy as a result. Men are confused, they're lost, they're suffering. Women are lost, confused, they're suffering. 
families are degenerating, babies are being killed. This is no progress at all. This is a this is a complete regression and a barbarism of human uh, behavior and, and mindset. So it succeeded in that it has completely destroyed that which is good and the root structure of our society, but it's failed to give what it promised, which is some sort of utopia. Yeah, powerfully put. And that brings us with your comments about babies being killed to the next episode topic, which was the declining sperm count and the culture of death. Now, these two things generally go together. It's not entirely clear that sperm count is always related to fertility, but neither of them is a good thing. That's for sure. So it's part of the agenda. We think about uh, planned parenthood's roots, and we think about eugenics as well. What's going on here? What are the key points we want to reemphasize? Mike? So I think once again, this hits on the things that we mentioned the two episodes ago, the globalist deep population, sort of cosmopolitan one world government uh, project. And there are lots of soft power social engineering policies that want people to be deracinated, to be have low sperm count, to have um, to, be, to be aborting and contracepting and not developing families that when in aggregate would generate thick kinship groups that then offer a bulwark against the or and a self-sufficient bulwark against this, these globalist projects. Uh, and then additionally to that, I would say the sperm count thing is also probably a side effect also of our uh, terrible divorce from nature and our own bodies and the, uh, the terrible sad American diet and uh, processed foods and uh, poor water supply and, and all these things men, men not exercising. Uh, so that whole nexus of things is uh, what we talked about in that episode. Yeah. Good summary, Tim, anything to add? It's, it's Catholic men. We believe in the mind body connection, which is, you know, very Aristotelian. It's called hylomorphism. And as it applies to sperm count, it's like, look, if you put a man in a room, this isn't magic, by the way, with a woman who's bawling him out and uh, emasculating him, his, this is going to affect his sperm count. And, and, and at first people are like, what are you, what are you talking about? If you run for longer than 25 minutes, it starts filling your system with estrogen. If you, if a man, how a man's feeling, what he's actually doing in a room can affect his body. If a man's, you know, got an anxiety disorder and his body is filled with cortisol and stress hormones, it's bad for him. It can kill him early. So what, what some people dismiss as foolish um, as I guess hypochondriac to believe that there's a mind body connection is ridiculous. Your, your, your mental outlook affects your actual body. And when men are surrounded by cackling, screeching women who are disrespecting them to use a term someone used earlier, it actually does affect their bodies and it does so in a negative way. And this is like the psychology of Satan. He, he knows all this, and this is why the feminism stuff is always first. It's the original sin, and it is the sin that seems to be wrapping the world up now, assuming there's some reasonable chance we may be in the penultimate or ultimate epoch. Great point about the connection between the mind and the body, because so many people like to bring up how Men look different now from a few decades ago. Lower testosterone, lower sperm count, smaller jaws, etc. Even stuff like dental records too. People are making all kinds of comparisons thinking, what happened? Well, connect it to the state of mind as well. I think that's massively overlooked. Elliot, culture of death and declining sperm count. What are your thoughts? Yeah, I can't help but to think that this attack against uh, patriarchy, uh, attack against men, the attack against the family, um, all go hand in hand with a declining sperm count. Now, whether or not this is happening through chemical castration 
or as Tim put it, you know, the, the mental, social aspects of destroying a man's physiology, uh, they all go, they're all part parcel. And um, I, I think Tim sort of mentioned it, but I just had to point out uh, this new world order that is unfolding is a female world order. It's a feminine world order. It's a feminist world order because the oligarchs, the world rulers, know that women are much more easy to manipulate. And if they can just get women to follow their suit, quote unquote, in or women, uh, then men will essentially become women because because then that the order of of structure. It's a, it's again, once again, it's an inversion. It's a perversion, right? Where they're t teaching women to be more like men. And so what do we have women doing? We have women behaving like men in sexual acts, right? They're they're uh, castrating themselves with birth control, chemical castration through birth control pills. They're having sports sex uh, as if they have unlimited eggs, like a man is to have unlimited sperm. Uh, and then the opposite is happening. It's like men's uh, germ, um, our sexual cell cell structure is uh, become, <laughs> becoming less and less, like limited. Like a like a woman's is in terms of her limited amount of eggs. Now it's like you know let's limit the man's, let's limit the man's uh, sex germ, and so I don't know. It's just it goes hand in hand with what we're saying in terms of how we're literally, literally living in an inverted world where everything is the opposite. Yeah. Can I add something to what Elliot just said? Well, yeah, yeah. I just want to read. Uh, I was thinking of a Christmas movie I just watched with my family. It's not the best one, but we 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 try to watch Christmas movies for a few weeks, so we we scrape the bottom of the barrel by the end. And it's uh, Polar Express, where each of the kids on this Christmas train are given a mandate at the end by Tom Hanks. You know, then not a good idea for kids to listen too much to Tom Hanks for several reasons I won't get into. But um, you know, the little girl, it's a little black girl is given on, on her train ticket, it's punched the mandate to lead. And if, if folks were like, what's Elliot talking about when he said that in Agenda 2030, you know, women are being brought into leadership deliberately under the diabolic agency or something like that. Don't make no mistake. They're being told this in Disney movies. They're being told very expressly, you need to lead. Men are not the leaders. Men need to be the followers. And I wanted to contrast this with the uh, words of Pius X, who said it is a mistake to maintain that women's rights are the same as man's. Women in war or parliament are outside their proper sphere, and their position there would be the desperation and ruin of society. Woman created as man's companion must so remain always under his power. That's patriarchy, baby. That's what Christianity is all about, and that's why smash the patriarchy really means smash Christianity. And we can talk about this from a secular biological level all day and everything supports our position. But ultimately, human beings aren't reducible to that perspective, to that plane. And we have to go deeper. And the first feminist was the devil. That's where it all begins, trying to invert the proper order of men and women. And you can't understand this fully unless you appreciate it on that level. Now, Responding to this, we then had an episode all about why men must build muscle. And we can probably get through this one relatively quickly because it kind of solves the problems of number seven. And let's take as our starting point, Tim's emphasis on hylomorphism. We are a union of mind and body and training the body also involves training the mind. And Christianity has traditionally been really supportive of physical culture. Why wouldn't it be? It's the religion of the incarnation. So, Elliot, you're all about this. Big part of your life, physical training. What's the benefit of men doing it in a nutshell? Well, in a world where we uh, hold academia up high, which I'm not saying that we shouldn't, but most men are, are, are uh, recognized by the standards put forth by the school. Um, for me, that, that didn't work so well. I wasn't really uh, adept at school. But the minute I got under a barbell, the minute I started using my body, the minute I began putting in some effort 
in order to have a return on my investment, which happened with weight training, then I discovered a critical law of nature, right? You only get it, you only get out what you put in. So in other words, this it's a, it's a training of principles when you allow men to use their bodies for what they were meant for, which is to be strong and to be virile, to be, ver to be uh, um, vital, uh, especially in a world that has us sitting behind desks all day, that doesn't have, that doesn't uh, venerate or hold high physical labor even, right? Like our ancestors would always have a physical or many cultures would have a physical rites of passage for young men to show them either where they are not or where they are going. For example, the, 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 the stones of strength that the Scottish would use in order to vet a boy for his ability to be of value to the, to the working structure. You know, today we call it working class. I guess back in the day, we just called it men, but to be worthy of working alongside the men, which was something to esteem to, to look forward to, you had to demonstrate that you're getting stronger, right? Not just, you know, memorizing your, uh, your, your, your times tables or memorizing false history, but are you physically growing as a man? Can you, can you pull your body up? You know, I don't care how many, uh, you know, how good your grammar is, uh, but if you can't climb a rope, if you can't pick up a rock, if you can't throw a ball or throw a rock, if you can't point a bow and arrow, if you can't do anything physical, then really you're only half a man. Yep. Powerful message. And guys know that at their core as well, which is why they get depressed when they get out of shape. The male psyche, the male body knows that on a level even beneath conscious awareness. So emasculation, mental and physical goes together. Mike, you've lived a physically pretty demanding life or different kinds of pursuits. What has that meant to you? I would say it just echoes uh, Elliot's sentiment that it becomes a crucible and a forum for character building, mental toughness, virtuous habit and uh when you're on and those things are all working together then you can be you can have capabilities and capacities that allow you to be a efficient provider and protector which we, as men and as christian men we're called to do so it's, it goes beyond just bodybuilding aesthetic and getting abs it's having capacities that in an emergency scenario in a self-defense scenario in um, just basic working, you can have those capacities to translate your will into action to help protect and provide for your loved ones, your family, and collectively for your nation. So uh, that's what, what that means to me. And I think that's why it's so fundamental uh, to being a man and to being a, a patriotic man. Yeah, you need your body to do things. So mm -hmm. train it for that task. Tim. All I would point out that I'm, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna do better than Elliot or Mike uh, in in pointing people to the barbell. I mean, folks that listen to people like Elliot or Mike know, you know, they can they can learn how to how to do this really well from these guys. But I would just say, look at the teleology that's that that insinuates men need to work out and and, and women aside from. Everyone's got to keep their heart and their arteries clean and stay thin, stay light. Women do not. Look, we, we talked about the teleology of bodies mm -hmm. and even the disparate outcome of when a man gets really strong, develops a lot of testosterone, or women get strong, develop a lot of testosterone for sports. Teleology never lies. Men become more fecund, fertile, virile. They become more manly. When they get strong and they get really good at athletics women what happens to so many of these olympians at a relatively but not just when they're in like olympian shape but even a lot a lot a lot of female athletes which we reported on in that episode they become more like men they stop being able to reproduce uh sometimes the effect goes away sometimes it doesn't they literally their bodies don't like it when men get manly it's good for them when women get manly and strong and athletic too athletic it's not good for them now that doesn't mean they shouldn't run running develops estrogen that's that's very good for for females but the teleology doesn't lie 
yeah, often overlooked point. And brings us to the topic of our next episode, which was women in blood sports and why it's one of the signs of cultural decline. This episode actually looked at seven signs of decline from falling Rome, but this was one of the top ones. A culture can be judged by how it views its women, what it values in them. And I think what's really going on here is that we're a culture that doesn't value motherhood, doesn't value the traditional feminine life. And feminism is really a kind of misogyny, which says we want you to behave like watered down men. And we want the men to become emasculated as well and fall to that level. And we just end up with this kind of androgynous, boyish muck that is going to lead to population decline. So thoughts on the fact that feminism is misogyny and women in MMA and combat sports more broadly, maybe even one day in the military being conscripted is the ultimate end point of this. Mike, let's start with you. Yeah, it's just um, it's, it's all the hallmarks of declining Rome, Weimar Germany, etc. Yeah, th these are just canary in the coal mine notes of men in patriarchy aban abandoning their duties and uh and this is what the culture begins looking like it begins generating generates suddenly and i feel like we're um we're approaching that that suddenly point um and yeah it's, it's certainly the case that watching a, a w women batter themselves in in a, a, a cage for, for like for like like consume like base consumer like just market um entertainment uh i think is yeah it's definitely has to be along with abortion one of the the just obvious canaries in the coal mine like so many others right i mean trans and trans children now i suppose is the the, the new canary in the coal mine but i don't know it's just the, the normalization of all this stuff it, any healthy society would be horrified at, at where we are right now and yet now we've got some guys who are considered alpha promoting all this. Tim, that's a symptom of disorder too, right? The men who are supposed to be at the top of the male status hierarchy are the ones who are some of the most cucked of all. Absolutely. Oh, I, I, I bitched a lot about uh, Dana White's promotion. I mean, Dana White's a pimp promoting female on female blood sports and he has the commentators all going oh you know when when females are fighting each other like guys could be excited about this um falsely dignifying it tricking the women into thinking it's cool and then what happened uh three nights ago he's beating the shit out of his wife he doesn't believe women are tough it's a ruse he's part of a uh you know a sophist class helping to play fake images and shadows on the cave wall people wake up obviously women aren't tough i want to read you another quotation from another 20th century pope this time benedict the 15th with religions decline cultured women have lost their sense of shame along with their piety think of women in the octagon many in order to take up tasks ill befitting their sex took to imitating men others abandoned the duties of wives for which they are formed to be cast into the current of life. Uh, there, there, I have so many more of these papal quotes from the 20th century, not from scriptural times, you know, that, that was a Judaic context. The modernists will tell you, no, these 20th century popes all saw what was happening. The, the uh, bestialization of men and the masculization of females is what evil groups like the World Economic Forum had to do to centralize power and to take over the world. So yes, obviously women should not be taught to attack and to hit. Women are, what's the ideal woman? It's little women, like the book. They should be demure, they should be filled with grace, they should bring out man's better nature, not by shrieking at him and definitely not by slapping him or hitting him, but by providing a, a kind of upward civilizing force in society which no women very few women very few women anymore do very few women are ladies and it's because we're cultivating it out of them little women if that phrase upsets you you're a feminist whether you're male or female 
Nice, Tim. So, Elliot, I want to use your comment as a bridge between this topic and the next one because building on this, we said that men need to, Christian men need to remember it's their duty to fight sometimes. Now, you've got daughters, lots of them, and we're thinking about your role as a protector, a man who's fighting for them, your duty as a father, protecting them from this culture which is misogynistic and doesn't value them as females. What kind of things do you do to fight back? Well, uh, having a happy, healthy marriage and loving their mother and being a husband to her, therefore giving an example for what they should seek. Uh, I think it's, in a way, it helps my family that we live in such a degenerate world because all we have to do is point to their friends' families, point to the, 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 the neighbors' families, just point outside of our home and they can see very quickly, oh, that doesn't work. That doesn't look happy. That doesn't look healthy. And so whatever uh, imaginary idea that the media pumps into their brains in terms of what it looks like to be a strong, independent woman or you know, sexual freedom, they can quickly see the results and contrast it between how myself and their mother and our family as well as uh, their grandparents, right? My, I come from a, a, a strong family. My father's a patriarch. My mother's a, 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 was a wonderful mother and wife. Um, so they know in their heart, they see in their experience, there's no doubt about it that the traditional way is the right way. And then anything that is positioned as virtuous out in the world uh, only yields rotten fruit. And it's very plain to see. Yeah, that's important. People sometimes ask me, how did you feel when you got fired and you lost your house? And, you know, Christmas time 2020, I found out that was it. And they were referring me to the professional body, which could ban me from teaching for life, potentially. They didn't, but they could have done. And my response is that my biggest fear was that my wife might have to work outside mm -hmm. the home. And... I didn't believe God would let that happen and things worked out okay for me, but only because I was willing to work at midnight and 1am sometimes teaching students in different countries, other time zones. Because as a man, my biggest priority was keep my wife at home with the kids. Can't have her working outside. That's right. Because that's one of the traps that people fall into. Um, and if you're doing that and you're happy with it, uh, that's a big part of the feminist agenda. So enabling your wife to live a traditional feminine life at home with the kids, that's one of the most important things a man can do, in my opinion. Tim, you got daughters right. too? Fighting? Or, or are we doing the outside work outside the home? Or kind of both? Kind or, of both. Or, or, yeah. So we could do a little bit on physical fighting if you want, but the... The role of fighting goes beyond mere physical fighting. Yeah, yeah. I mean, when I think I think that was my topic, and we we massaged it. Uh, you know, I have a, I have a Catholic audience, and a, it's all it's one of the hardest cells of anything I bring to them. Obviously, it's a hard sell to get two income households mm -hmm. who have you know the guilty conscience. They know kind of kind of what they're doing. Um, to, to stop being a two income household. So it's a bit of a fight there, but it's a fight to get them to fight, to abandon the, the wifely income. But that's still not probably as unpopular is what I say when I'm like, well, I mean, men should actually know how to fight that most, most Catholics and Christians are fine with it. If you put it in the context of learn a, a martial art and get really good at that, because that sounds orderly and disciplined and is good. But when I said like, look, just, young men probably should be in some fights then it gets hairy i thought i thought on that episode we would talk share some street fighting stories just because it's kind of fun but then people say oh are you glorifying it in a wrong way i don't know it's a very thin line between how do you learn to fight without without you know engaging in some error and i'm the first one to admit i engaged in a lot of error that that led to this kind of wild young man's lifestyle you know, I was ro rolling around playing in a band at all hours of the night, even in college. And so we didn't get to it quite in that episode. And I think, you know, maybe that's good. I, I don't know where people's sensibilities are, but it's a touchy issue because to, to learn to fight, you have to 
you have to get in some fights and um, you, know, you might might incur some serious sin there, which I never advocate. As as to the household income, this is the main form of the dialogue on feminism. Uh, you know, first, second, third, fourth wave feminism, they're all, it's all the same thing. There's no distinction of kind here. Not really even much of a distinction of degree. Simone de Beauvoir, the French feminist, was once in dialogue with the younger American feminist, Betty Friedan, and she said, you Americans, you're obsessed with your freedoms. If feminism is to take off in America, you're going to have to do what we've done in France, which is force women out of the home, force women to get jobs, and I don't know if you Americans are willing to do it. Women are not going to willingly leave the home and go get jobs because they're so, it's such a natural, it's second nature to them. It's first nature. And feminism can't take off unless we uncouple women from their babies and from their kids, get, get kids away from the, the mothers. So that's why they created this economy, which is really asinine. Everyone you know that has two incomes, unless the wife is a super high earner, then it's asinine because they're spending most of their income on daycare. So they're just breaking even. So what was the point of this? Well, it was this satanic intellect, which just wanted mothers out of the home to debase women. And then you can pull children into the state schools, which can socialize them, uh, communists socialize them. And this is precisely what they've done. So, so work outside the home has been ground zero in the war in America and in Europe, uh, in the feminist war. And this is the thing that it's the hardest to get conservatives to do. A lot of the ones, even trads will tell me, I can't. we want to, but how do you do this in the modern era? How do you, how did you have, all, I don't know, I was a school teacher, not making, I made a decent salary for a school teacher, but since we got married, aside from a little, a little job here or there before, you know, 10 hours a week or something before we had kids, Steph has never had to work. And even when we had five, four, five, six kids, before I was doing this on the internet, supplementing the income, it was always easy enough with a little bit of frugality to get by on one income. So they cooked up this myth that massages the conscience of even trads who uh, farm their wives out to work. Yeah, and just to be clear, even if the wife is a super high earner, that's still bad. You look at the of course. statistics. Yeah, look at divorce statistics. The woman earning more than a husband is one of the best predictors of divorce and also male impotence. So mm. you know as a yeah. man this isn't supposed to be happening. And if you try and convince yourself that it's okay, well, then your body's not going to agree. I was like, just saying yeah. legit. It's still, it's still morally wrong even yeah. if the wife is a high earner. It's just logistically asinine given yeah. what – 90% of working wives make. They're literally pissing away that income on paying for health care or, or paying for child care. Yeah. Yeah, that's it. So, Mike, you're a, a single guy, but you're looking to get married. And what kind of thoughts do you have in listening to Elliot and Tim describing the priorities of a man? Could be to do with fighting for the family. Could be to do with what you should truly value. Yeah, I think uh, myself and men in general that are feel that vocation really need to prioritize their capacity to protect and uh, to provide and really set their lives up and, and order their their way of being in the world that allows for that, allows for that space and the possibility then for a woman to properly be a wife and a mother and to not have those worlds uh, in this topsy turvy mixed upside down version that we've been doing since the seventies at, at least. Uh, so yeah, my, my priorities are, are to, to really set up the, my life in such a way that, that the aspects of protection and provisioning are, um, are covered excessively. So to allow for that and this that that was very much my reasoning for wanting to do the return of the land episode because i think that that is connected to this as well you know if we can become frugal and less consumers that actually does free up the the possibility of of people thinking this way yeah i think that's a really good connection and that's actually our last two topics to cover today so how biblical courtship differs from modern dating 
and then why the return to the land is important to enable this, why we want stronger homesteads. So, Elliot, I guess you've probably been doing the most on this with guys coming to you for relationship advice. What is the top thing that modern dating gets wrong and what is the main solution to it biblically? Well, it's fornication. Uh, that's when we get into these unholy unions with women that we otherwise probably would never consider trying to spend our lives with. I see so many uh, relationships and the men that I'm dealing with, that I work with, uh, that fall apart because they're addicted to the sex with this woman before actually getting to know who she is. It's, uh, it's, a, it's a chemical blindness, right? The cascade of hormones that happens that creates this uh, fleshly, emotional, physical bond with a person that uh, for every other intent and purpose, ra both rational and spiritual, uh, do not make any sense whatsoever. And so what we get wrong is what happens before uh, we even really even get to know somebody, which is we're jumping into bed with them. And the right way to go about it would be to go back to the days when you would want to get to know a person before you get into bed with them. You would, and then that, and then of course the real, the right way is to have sex within the marriage. Of course, we talked earlier about how that's a tough thing to swallow for men in a world where they've been given, you know, the, the goods, they've been told that there's something virtuous about boning bunch of women. Uh, but the only way we're going to return to patriarchy, to a well-ordered society, to a world where things work out well is when we stop fornicating. Hard to do for guys who are grabbed by the balls by this ideology, which knew that was the place to get them. But why should we expect anything important to be easy? I think that's exactly right, Elliot. Yeah. Tim, biggest problem with modern dating, and then what are we going to do about it? I think the biggest problem with modern dating is that it's not viewed as an epistemic information gathering project, which is all it is. You date as long as it takes you to figure out whom to marry. And trads in trying to reconfigure this and correct the heirs of dating say, oh, courtship's right. And they talk about them like there's a distinction of, of kind. I, I, think, I think it's a distinction of degree. I think if you date right, you are courting. And how do you date right? You just view each session getting together with, with a girl, taking her out in very under very limited conditions. I, mean, I, don't, think, I don't think having a, a third party there is actually conducive to getting to know each other. I, I think it should be just quick, quick little dates solo. You know, you, you're, you're, I'm going to tell my daughters you can go out for an hour and a half at a time, long enough to get to the restaurant and come back. You need to kind of be able to have a private convo because that's the only way to get to know someone in a true enough sense to get married. And of course, uh, every third date, you can just come watch a movie with your, with your whatever boyfriend, your gentleman caller here with the fam. That's fine, but you need some one-on-one -on -one time as well. I think that uh, also dating nowadays is not done teleologically toward marriage as an information gathering project under the proper chronological parameters. Chronologically, it does not take two years, three years to get to know someone enough. You're supposed to get married as soon as you have the affirmative evidence slash information requisite for making the good determination. This is a good, this person is, they say. So six to, six to 12 months, I'm trying to be less fringe by, by widening it out. I usually say six to nine months is what it should take. If you're dating someone, um, you know, one, one to two times a week, uh, it's information gathering and it doesn't take that long. You, you only need to see them in a certain modicum uh, quorum of situations in order to get the information you need. So the, mod so the main problem, to answer your question, well, is that dating is not done in an in information gathering sense, but it's been given a kind of ontological status as, a, as an Aristotelian sub, substance itself. 
And what I mean is it's treated as its own end. Are you boyfriend and girlfriend? I don't have a problem with the term if it just means is this the person you're regularly kind of going out with in order to test them out for marriage. That's fine to come up with the term. But this, there's no status. to You're single until you're married. Nowadays in the secular world, They've reified this Frankenstein's monster of, oh, are you a couple? It's like, well, you're a couple when you're married. Um, are you single people? Single people will say this. They'll say, oh, I, I'm, you know, I'm not available. It's like, well, you might be dating someone exclusively. That's fine. But you're still single. You're only not single anymore when you're a couple. So as society's gotten sluttier, the steady couple has become seen more as a, an Aristotelian substance and it's not, it's, it's a, it's an influx temporary status as a potentially married couple is, is feeling each other out, not feeling each other up, feeling each other out as potential sp spouses. Yeah. Really subtle point. I think crucial as well. Relationships are an invention and weapon of the sexual revolution. And, the time was when it was just called cohabitation and it's bad and it produces bad results. So we need to get back to just calling it for what it is bluntly. Mike, you spent a long time in this kind of world. So you know what the arguments these guys make are and where they lead to. What do you think is wrong with modern dating? What's wrong with modern dating? Gosh, this could be another whole episode. Uh... <laughs> I mean, yeah, the, the the sexual degeneracy that we're in, the valuing of people as a as a means of uh, pleasure seeking, of, of hedonic stimulus, of this uh, throwaway culture where everything's looked at as transactional, right? And and no one works on relationships; they just move on, trade up to the next next person. Um, but I think ultimately, you know, it comes away from our center and our orientation isn't towards the most high. So it brings me back to the, the C.S. Lewis quote, right? You know, put first things first and you get first and second things, put second things first, you get neither first and second things. And I think that that's the main, main thing I'm trying to live in my life now, right? Where it's like, rather than putting relationships or women, uh, as one's first thing, put God as your first thing. And then the, the close second thing will, will be the relationship. So that's, that's what I'm trying to orient to, uh, as opposed to the, the world that I was in before. Yeah. If you, if you get the big things right, you'll get the small things right. If you get the big things wrong, you'll get the small things wrong too. I would just add that the guys who are supportive of or using contraception have got a really big thing wrong. And once you mm -hmm. divorce sex from its primary end, which is children, then you're going to end up with all kinds of chaos the crisis regarding masculinity and femininity is mainly because those two things got severed from reproduction in the sexual revolution. So people are walking around thinking, well, what, what's a man? What's a woman? Mm -hmm. Potential for fatherhood, potential for motherhood. Those are the two fundamental essences of each. All right. Well, we've covered pretty much everything we wanted to today. Our most recent one on return to the land was essentially a re-emphasis of some of the points we just looked at there about the primacy of fathers and the importance of the family as the fundamental building block. And if we are able to be frugal and then live in a more self-sufficient way, then that principle of subsidiarity that Tim has been clarifying and explaining so well is where patriarchal authority really comes to full fruition. We can't do that living as bug men in cities who are reliant on the primary needs of our families uh, from other people. We've got to do it for ourselves where possible because that's where authority really comes into being. Guys, thanks so much. We covered a lot today and I think it's been a really useful recap for everybody. I would encourage people who've been interested by particular topics that they might have missed the full episode on to go back, watch it, share it with people you think might benefit and i've got the channels of all these guys in the show notes so click on them subscribe to them if you aren't already looking forward to the next one guys exciting project same thanks here. right thanks, yeah. will. thanks will all right take care see you next week bye Peace. fellas later